I began these six sessions with this paragraph summarizing the American myth. America is a nation of immigrants drawn to these shores for religious freedom and the opportunity to create a new society. God has chosen this nation for special work in the world and for special blessings for those blessed enough to live here. Although we've had our issues with race and with Indian peoples, those are largely in the past. America is the greatest nation and the greatest democracy the world has ever seen. We are a shining city on a hill, except when the wrong people are in power. America is a land of opportunity and freedom. It might have been a nation of small farms and villages, if Jefferson had his way, but Hamilton and Madison won out. It is a large commercial nation where the freedom to engage in business, to better yourself and your family, is of high and maybe the highest importance. It is a nation of freedom of association, of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to think what you please. It is meant to be a nation of minimal and local government, an arrangement that both requires and maximizes the need for personal responsibility. You should enjoy the just fruits of your labor. The rich should be allowed to grow richer, the middle classes should flourish, and the poor can pull themselves up through hard work. Everyone deserves a fair chance to succeed. The markets set the meritocracy that should determine the winners and losers. Any inequality that develops is due to the working out of markets over long periods of time. We are a nation of laws to which everyone is subject. What is wrong with this American myth? Fundamentally, everything related to being special or exceptional because we are chosen by God and because the chosen we required a hierarchy and inequalities based on race, gender, and class. In short, in this myth, preserving freedom for the elect is more important than a more perfect union where freedom and justice for all are valued. The myth is false because who truly belongs and who occupies which rung of the moral order have been determined and buttressed by white, predominantly male Protestant Christianity and those expressions of Christianity are heretical. The received American myth is dying, but is being aggressively resuscitated. The power relations derived from the myth are both weakening, and there are full bore efforts to preserve them. But the resuscitation will resemble Frankenstein, magnifying the flaws of its creator, and tear a path of destruction. We the nation, we the church, and we the world are living in a dangerous, perilous time. I would judge this time to be more dangerous than any previous time in my life, including when I walked under a clear October sky in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis, wondering if I would see the nukes before they hit Chicago and evaporated everything and everyone I knew. We the nation are on the verge of losing the fundament of our democracy, that one's vote means anything regarding who is elected and which laws and policies are passed. The power of consent may be withdrawn. Christian churches, basically conservative institutions propping up and expected by the powers that be to prop up the social order are either so entwined with or infected by political and moral hatred that we are not positioned to offer vivid alternatives or potent resistance to the continued bastardization of Christianity or to its cultural marginalization. In fact, the worst demons of the nation's nature and the worst demons of Christianity's lived history are dancing together. It is abundantly evident in scientific studies and widespread experiences, the ecology in which we live and move and have our being on this planet is under siege. Look at the death and disruption caused by the pandemic. One pandemic. What will the world's governments do when there are food and water wars and massive migrations? Or if a nation does again what only our nation has done thus far, use a nuclear weapon in battle? And if we don't sever ourselves rather rapidly from a fossil fuel-based 
consumer economy, a break that requires radical changes, our children or children's children will face social and ecological collapse, which would surely engender extreme violence. Furthermore, nothing good or big enough to make a positive difference in this world can happen without a combination of transparency and trust. And the wells of these social necessities within and between nations are bone dry. Distressing and depressing? Yes. But is there also a call to action? Yes, if you believe it is important to act faithfully, even when the opposing forces are superior in power. Based on everything I've said in this course and the very tuttle bursting wineskins, you'll know what I believe. Churches and the nation need to own a different story. Well, here's a personal creed I wrote that articulates what I believe should be corrections to our story. I believe the U.S. is one of the nations of the earth, not God's chosen people. The U.S. has a responsibility to our nation, to other nations, as fellow human beings and to our planetary home. The nation is we the people, not a church. We the people is a much larger and diverse group than any one church or religion, and the nation's ways are not necessarily the church's ways. The nation's heart is morally complex, ambiguous, and messy, not simply all good or all bad. There's great beauty and profound ugliness in our history and in our present. The president is an elected leader, not a messiah or savior who can deliver us from ourselves. Elected leaders are neither angels nor demons, but are influenced by and can amplify the people's angels and demons. The Constitution is an evolving document, neither eternal dogma nor inerrant scripture. Laws and policies permit, forbid, and channel behavior, but do not form or change hearts. Laws and policies are only as good as the people who wrote them. And because of the ironies of history and unintended consequences, probably more or less good than the people who wrote them. Culture is the womb from which purpose, morals, leaders, policies and practices are born and selected. Culture shapers, therefore, may be the most powerful of all influencers over time. Hearts are formed, broken, corrupted, healed, and changed at the level of culture. If you want to change hearts, change the culture. Well, one might argue that Christian churches have shaped local cultures and even the national culture. We have, even as uh, uh, even as cultures, local and national, have shaped churches. The power of congregations to shape culture is still strong in some places in the country, very weak in others, and mostly void at the national level, except as appropriated by politicians for partisan purposes. But we still have some cultural power. Religion News Service reporter Jack Jenkins reminded us as he documented the role of Catholic nuns in fighting for the Affordable Care Act into law and the inroads the Reverend William Barber made in North Carolina politics with Moral Mondays. So here are a few ways I continue to believe Christian congregations could benefit the culture, could add a beneficial nutrient to the soil of culture, a nutrient that would enrich both local churches and their host communities. Promote curiosity rather than omniscience. A term from my Wesleyan tradition is experimental Christianity. Christians do not have everything figured out, including what the Bible may mean in a particular time and space. We experiment, observe the results, inquire as to why something happened or did not happen, and try again. When our assumptions about the way things should work don't work, we examine the assumptions and change. We need to keep asking questions such as, how did this come to be? Why are things this way? How does this work? How might one change this or that? Can one change this or that? And what is the future for which we are willing to work and sacrifice? We can practice conversation rather than pronouncing dogma. 
Communities are not perfectible term papers. Truth is at least as much discovered through conversation and argument as it is revealed. Nothing prevents congregations from reseeding their capacity to talk with one another, to deliberate, to conflict, and yet stay at the table, to see what we might see together. These are skills practiced but never perfected. Deliberately meeting others rather than enclosing ourselves in comfort circles is another strategy. I'm heartened by the congregations that have been forming relationships that cross significant cultural barriers. This practice paired with skill building for difficult conversations would build valuable social capital and strengthen local cultures. Fearlessly learning history rather than burying or whitewashing it. I meant for this course to be a demonstration of this kind of learning Christians need to do in regard to our own history and actions in American public life. Regardless of what legislators, curriculum watchdogs, and school boards decide can and cannot be taught in public schools, churches have no such restrictions. Retrieving and bolstering practices of confession, repentance, making amends, and forgiveness. Our nation needs rituals for social repair. All religious traditions practice or did practice rituals for atonement. Are the understandings and practices of confession, repentance, making amends, and forgiveness strong within your community of faith? If so, you may have something to offer beyond your walls. If these understandings and practices are not strong currently, what would it take to strengthen them? Well, I'm going to close this session and this class with my tribute to one of the greatest pieces of American rhetoric. Abraham Lincoln spoke at the dedication of the cemetery after the horrific battle of Gettysburg. The speech flows from baptismal imagery. Dying and new birth are the themes. But note the temporal markers. Death is visible at the present. New birth is a possibility within the people's power to live toward, to receive, or reject. Here is my version of this address written for the 4th of July. Within this rendering are elements of a new story, a different understanding of belonging, a new moral order, and a new perception of what we the people must do in order to become the people we should be. Twelve score and five years ago, our forefathers brought forth in this continent a, a new nation, conceived in liberty, bondage, and theft, but dedicated to the proposition that all human beings are created equal. Now in the 21st century, we are engaged in a powerful cultural battle testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can actually grow into its full potential with liberty and equality and justice for all. Around us from social media to houses of worship to the stairs of the Capitol to voting booths, we have fashioned and fight upon battlefields. We have come here to dedicate a day of remembrance, celebrating those who have struggled to birth our nation into reality. We celebrate and remember those who gave their lives for freedom, equality, and justice, that the proposition of the nation may live and grow up. It is altogether fitting and proper we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow, the promise of this nation. The brave Americans who lived and died in service of a free, equal, and just nation have consecrated this promise, far above our poor power to add or detract. It is for us, the living rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which others of blessed memory have nobly advanced. Our task is this, that from our honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, 
shall have a new birth of freedom, equality, and justice, and that a government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall be realized and then not perish from the earth.